I'm the Comic Weekly Man, the jolly Comic Weekly Man, and I'm here to read the funnies to you, happy boys and honeys. Yes, boys and girls, it's Comic Weekly time, and here I come right into your house to bring a little fun and happiness. Right out of the pages of Puck the Comic Weekly, straight into your living room, your friend, the Comic Weekly Man, the jolly Comic Weekly Man. Hello, hello, hello. Hello, hello, hello. <laughs> Little Miss Honey, how are you today? I'm just fine. Well, that's wonderful. You know, I read about a most unusual thing this week. What? I read about a dog that got a diploma in school. A dog? Yes, the dog had gone to school every day for ten years. First with the oldest brother, then with the second brother, and finally with the youngest brother who graduated this year. And they gave the dog a diploma? Uh-huh. This time when the youngest brother got his diploma, they gave the dog one too because he never missed a day of school in ten years. My, isn't that sweet? Mm hmm Well, now can they read the funny piece? Because we have dogs there too, you know. Talk the comic weekly. Yeah. Very well, I'll read that in just a moment. But before I do, let's listen to this nice man. Now, here we go with Puck the Comic Weekly. And on the first page, hop along, Cassidy. Oh, Hoppy, Hoppy. I just love Hoppy. Very well, then we shall read Hoppy. Magic words for the music, please. Very well, my lady. Six guns blazing as he thunders along. Give us music for Hop Along. <laughs> Hoppy is returning to the Bar 20 Ranch after tracking down Calico, the leader of the counterfeiting gang. His pal Duke is surprised to see Hoppy carrying somebody on his horse. And he says, We're glad to have you back, Hoppy. Who's a stranger? Hoppy replies, A young Mexican lad, Duke. We found him spread eagled on the desert, delirious from the sun. A couple of the hands lift the boy off the horse. And Hoppy says, you Better take him into the house and see that he's made comfortable. When he's better, we'll learn who did this to him. A little later, first picture, second row, three horsemen gallop up to the ranch. They rein up in front of Hoppy. One says, uh, We're looking for a slippery young fellow who escaped the law. Maybe you run across him. Hoppy says, Maybe. What's he done? The man replies, He's wanted for horse stealing. Now if you gents will just turn him over to us. Hoppy holds up a knife saying, One moment. We three gents had this knife with a warning note attached thrown at us back in the desert. Judging from the alkali dust on your clothes, you've just come that way. And then Hoppy thrust the knife into the empty sheath the man's wearing, saying, And the knife seems to match your empty sheath. Last picture of the row, the stranger snarls, Why, you glib tongue maverick, I'll teach you to accuse me. Hoppy trips him, and first picture about him, Rowe falls against the ladder, and a pail of paint drops on his head. His two pals reach for their guns. Swiftly, California Lucky Flip lassoes over them, pinning their arms to their sides. And Hoppy says, Now, mount that chaos, and the three of you hightail it out of here. Last picture, California says, Well, that bucket of paint ought to cool him off for a spell. And Hoppy comments, We better keep a close watch over our young guest. I'm afraid we haven't seen the last of that threesome. Yes, that ought to change the color of his thinking. Oh, yes, but I'm afraid his thoughts will all be black ones. That'd mean no good for Hoppy. Well, we'll find out more about that next week. Now? Oh, is Prince Valiant on the next page again? Well, let's turn over to page three and see. Oh, there he is. Remember, Prince Valiant was looking for a way across the mountains, and he came to the uh, monastery. Yes, and the abbot there told Val he'd help him. So he called for a guide who could show Val the way. And then the guide told Val that they'd have to wear very warm clothes crossing the mountains. And then when they were making clothes for Val, they had to use all the warm skins that they had. Yes, chamois skins. And Val said he'd go hunting for the chamois to get more skins for the monks in the monastery. So now let's read Prince Valiant in the Days of King Arthur. Eckert, Breckert, Ray Malkin, and Quince. Music romantic for a fair, fair prince. <laughs> Prince.
Prince Valiant sets off for the hunt, leaving his companions to secure the equipment they'll need on that perilous journey over the pass. Paul, the mountain man who's to be their guide, goes with Val to show him the way and to tell him how to hunt the wily chamois, an animal that lives among the higher peaks of the mountains. They're a very nimble-footed animal and can leap and climb from crag to crag like a mountain goat. Up, 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 Val climbs, until last picture top row, the vast snow fields seem to tower over his head. But all day long, he plods upward, and they seem no nearer. But by this time, it's dark, and night falls. Val builds a campfire, first picture, next row, and his campfire is a tiny glow of warmth amid the lonely, silent peaks. Next morning, Val is up early, and last picture of the row, before sunrise, he finds a spot overlooking an alpine meadow, and here he waits, still as any stone. When the morning sun breaks, Val sees in the distance animals coming into sight. First picture, bottom row, down from the lofty cliffs come the chamois, leaping gracefully from ledge to ledge in the morning sunlight, trusting the sentinels that precede the herd. Slowly, the herd follows the leaders, who move forward closer and closer toward Val. Last picture, Val waits, poised. The slightest alarm, and they'll vanish like mist among the crags. Closer and closer they come, as Val waits with arrow to his bow. Yes. And look at the way they jump from one rock to another. I'd slip and fall if I did that. So would I. Isn't it wonderful what some animals can do? Yes, and next week we'll find out more about them. And now, if you're interested... Oh, if it's Br'er Rabbit, I am. Well, that's <laughs> just what I was coming to. So let's turn over the page and go past Jungle Jim and Buzz Sawyer, turn over the next page, and in the middle of page seven is Uncle Remus and his tales of Br'er Rabbit. Say the magic words with me. Hippity hoppity, hoppity, make, make it, it a habit, habit to give us music for old Bro Rabbit. <laughs> Uncle Remus says, Bro Weasel is all the time looking for something for nothing, and he usually finds both. Yes, this day, Bro Weasel is rummaging around in a garbage can, and he finds a book. He looks at it and exclaims, Well, look at here. This your book tells how to hypnotize folks. And as he stands there reading the book, Br'er Rabbit comes down the road. When Br'er Weasel hears Br'er Rabbit whistling, he says to himself, I'll just try some of this hypnotizzy stuff on Br'er Rabbit. And if it works, I'll skin him clean. As Br'er Rabbit comes up to him, Br'er Weasel turns around suddenly and waves his finger in front of Br'er Rabbit's eyes. Hokey to pokey to zippity zing. You was now under my mystic spell, and you does everything I say. Burr Rabbit trembles. His arms drop to his side, and he stands as in a trance, his eyes closed, and a happy smile on his face. Burr Weasel tells him last picture, You always leading me to your secret go, mom, Burr Rabbit. Burr Rabbit holds his arms out before him and starts walking down the road with Burr Weasel behind him. Over the hill they go. Down the dale, and up another hill. And first picture, bottom row, Burr Rabbit leads Burr Weasel straight to an old hollow log on a high cliff above the river. And then Burr Rabbit gets down on his hands and knees and starts to crawl into the hollow log. Burr Weasel exclaims, Well, butter my biscuits. He done let me straight to his gold mine. And then Burr Weasel gets on his hands and knees and crawls in after Burr Rabbit, who has just come out of the other end. And Burr Weasel exclaims, Hey, Br'er Rabbit, where's you at? It's dark in here. And Br'er Rabbit opens his eyes and with a cheerful smile gives the log a push. And it rolls over the cliff, into the river. And last picture, as one end of the log sticks up out of the water, Br'er Weasel pokes his head out of the log groggily. And Br'er Rabbit up on the cliff says with a giggle, <laughs> If that hypnotizing book was any good, I'd never throw it away. How dumb does Weasels get? And Uncle Remus says, The book teaches, but it's the learning which counts. <laughs> oh, that Br'er Rabbit. <laughs> Wasn't it funny how he fooled Br'er Weasel pretending to be hypnotized? Uh, 
hypnotized. He was, too. Oh, I know he was. Well, then why did you say he was not tied? I did not say he was not tied. You did so. You corrected me and you said hypnotized. Oh, I mispronounced it in trying to correct your pronunciation. You see, it's hypnotized. Oh. Well, he's very clever. Yes, he is. And so are you. Oh, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, and now? Oh, yes. It's Dagwood and Blondie. Well, it is indeed. <laughs> and there they are on the first page of the second section of Puck the Comic Weekly. So if you're all ready, let's shuffle off with Dagwood and Blondie. Ramafoo, Ramafum, Zim Zam Zombie. Conjure me music for Dagwood and Blondie. <laughs> One of Blondie's neighbors stops in today and says to her, Oh, Blondie, did you hear that Mrs. McNuff was ill? Blondie exclaims in sorrow, What a pity. So, a little later, after the neighbor lady is gone, Blondie comes into the living room with her coat on, carrying a casserole, and she says, Dagwood, I'm going to call on Mrs. McNuff and take her some soup. Blondie goes out the door, and Dagwood says, Oh, boy, that'll give me a chance to take a leisurely bath and not be disturbed. A little later, first picture next row, the front door opens, and a dozen women come in the house, chattering happily. And one of the women says, Oh, Edna, that was such a cute way to get Blondie out of the house. And Edna replies, Well, now we'll prepare things for the surprise party. Upstairs in the bathroom, Dagwood, who was in the bathtub reading a magazine, says, Hey, I hear women's voices. I hear people milling around. So he gets out of the bathtub, wraps a towel around his waist, and trots downstairs. Last picture of the row, he comes into the living room, where the women are working quietly. As he appears in the door, they all go, <laughs> Dagwood dashes upstairs, first picture, next row, yelling to his dog, Quick, Daisy, back in the tub, we'll lock the door. He dashes into the bathroom, and he finds two women there. Oh, oh. Dagwood, seeing his hiding place is gone, yells, Who let my bathwater run out? And one of the women answers in embarrassment, We're cleaning up the house for, for, for Blondie's surprise party. Oh, mm. Dagwood suddenly remembers he's not wearing clothes and runs into the bedroom. And he finds three women in there straightening up the room. And when they see Dagwood naked except for the towel, they all go... <laughs> Dagwood dashes out of the bedroom, down the hall. He sees another woman coming out of Cookie's room. First picture, bottom row, he says, Quick, Daisy, down the clothes chute! And leaps into the clothes chute. And lands in the laundry basket in the basement. At this moment, Blondie enters the house. And the women all yell, Surprise! <laughs> And last picture, Dagwood lying in the laundry basket in the basement, still wearing the towel, pants with exhaustion. <laughs> She'll never be as surprised as I was. <laughs> Wasn't that funny? Yeah. No matter where Dagwood went wearing just that old towel, he would bump into neighbor ladies. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know why they should be so frightened at seeing him, though, because, after all, that's all you wear when you go to the beach is just a pair of shorts. Yes, I think people are just plain silly. <laughs> I think so, too, but I love it when they make me laugh like Dagwood. So do I. That's why I like the funny people. <laughs> They're so funny. Yes. Oh, look, underneath Dagwood and Blondie, there's Roy Rogers, my favorite favorite. And I'll read that in just a moment, but first, here's that nice man with something interesting to say. Now, here we go again with Puck the Comic Weekly, and on the bottom of the first page of the second section with Roy Rogers, King of the Cowboys. Roy had met his friend, J. Lucian Dangerfield, owner of the Wild West Show, as he was driving along a road in a wagon. Yes, and when Roy stopped him to talk to him, a bad man named Handles Baldwin jumped up from under a blanket and ordered Roy to give him his clothes. And then Roy, under pretense of giving Baldwin his clothes, suddenly flipped his hat in Baldwin's face and so got the drop on him, tied him up, and put him in the wagon. But then Baldwin kicked the horses and made them run away, his hands still tied behind him. Yes, and when they came around the bend in the road at the top of the cliff, the wagon rolled over the cliff and Handel's Baldwin was still in the wagon. So let's find out today what happens to Baldwin. Here we go with Roy Rogers, King of the Cowboys. Magic words for the music, please. A yip by yo. Now here we go with Roy and Trigger. A yip by yo. Roy looks at the spot where the wagon went over the cliff. 
Dangerfield runs up and says, Roy, 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 what happened to the knave who tried to get away in my vehicle? Roy replies, Well, I can't see him in the wreck, Dangerfield. There's too much dust. Oh, thank goodness my sturdy team didn't share the fate of my wagon. Well, Handel's bald and must have got busted a bit, so Dangerfield. Let's take a look for a safe trail to the bottom. Dangerfield climbs onto one of his horses, and he and Roy ride down the cliff. When they get to the bottom, they find the wagon broken to bits, but no trace of Baldwin. And then Roy finds a rope in the bushes. He exclaims, Here, look, the rope I tied his hands with. The handles must have landed in these bushes. Dangerfield exclaims, Egad, Roy. Then the rascal may have escaped unhurt. He may be lurking nearby. At last picture of the row, a horrible thought comes to Dangerfield. Roy, if he's alive, we're doomed. The scoundrel made a threat to avenge himself on us for trying to deliver him to the sheriff. At this very moment, first picture bottom row, Baldwin, halfway up the cliff above Roy and Dangerfield, is prying a huge boulder loose, hoping it'll roll down and kill Roy. Baldwin says to himself, well, Rogers will spot me any second from below. But if I can get this rock rolling, he won't catch me. She's starting to move. And he gives the boulder a final push, and it rolls down the mountainside. Roy looks up and exclaims, Look out, Dangerfield! Boulder coming down! Dangerfield trips as he tries to get away. Roy grabs hold of him. Heave ho! Ah, it missed us. Are you hurt? And then Roy hears a galloping horse, and he looks up to see Baldwin and exclaims, It's Baldwin. He's getting away on the other horse. And from up above, Baldwin yells down, I miss you with that boulder, Rogers. But you and that local showman ain't heard the last of me. Handles Baldwin, don't forget. <laughs> Exactly what we thought might happen last week. He did land in the bushes and the rope did break and he got away. That means that Roy has a bitter enemy vowing to get even with him. Oh, that means this adventure is getting more exciting and dangerous. It certainly is. Oh, but I'm anxious to find out what happens next week. So am I. Well, now let's go over the page. Oh, and there's Flash Gordon. And I want to know more about this right now. Flash disguised himself as the wizard and got into the wizard's cave. And after he and Prince Fino had succeeded in tricking the workers in the wizard's cave to open the door, they overpowered them. And then Flash quickly put on the clothes of one of the wizards. Now they're headed for the inner part of the caves, hoping to find a way to free themselves. I'm anxious to see whether the guards inside the cave really believe that Flash is one of the wizards. Well, let's read right now and find out with Flash Gordon. Riga riga doon doon, Saskimatash. Let's have music for Heroic Flash. Disguised as one of the wizards, Flash gains entry into their underground fortress. He bluffs. Make way, guards. I've captured Dale and Queen Sunni. The startled guards fall back obediently, and Flash goes on safely. But as the doors to another entrance open, Flash has the bad luck to run into the chief wizard, Curzo himself. Curzo snarls. You scheming imposter! You shall die for this! Flash's reply is to spring to attack the tyrant. And one of the guards leaps at Flash. Curzo has no taste for hand-to-hand -hand fighting, and first pitch about him, Rope flees, shouting to the guards at the entrance. Bar the doors! Flood the caves with liquid fire! <laughs> fight with the guard has delayed Flash just long enough, and the door slides shut, trapping Flash and his friends. Suddenly, from cracks in the walls, burning oil spurts out in spreading streams. As the burning oil covers the floor, Flash shouts to his terrified friends, Climb up the walls! Don't give up! And up the walls of the cavern they climb. Flash picks through the row. Prince Pino suddenly calls out, Hey, this way, Flash! There's a trap door up here! Maybe we can force it open. Oh, I hope they can get 
let that trap door open because if they don't, they'll all be burned to death. Yes, this is one of the toughest spots Flash has ever been in. Oh, that old guard, if he hadn't stepped forward so quickly to stop Flash, Flash would have gotten that mean wizard and just fixed him good. Well, maybe he still has a chance if they can get that trap door open. That's something that's hard to wait for. Well, just save your fingernails for later. Stop chewing on them now. And let's skip over to the very last page and read Dick's Adventures. Oh, yes. That's something else I want to find out about because, you know, last week Dick began another adventure and he dreamed he was in the early days of America and he met Lafayette, a very handsome man in a three-cornered hat. Yes, American or a Frenchman who came to America to help the Americans in their fight against the English. Yes, but when they got to Philadelphia, the guard wouldn't let them go inside to see General Washington, and Dick couldn't understand why. Well, let's read and find out. Here we go with Dick's adventures, and say the magic words with me. Riggedy pack a zack a zick. That's some music for adventurous Dick. As the sentry at the door of Independence Hall in Philadelphia refuses to let Lafayette or his friend Baron de Calb enter, Dick exclaims, Well, gosh, something's wacky. He can't understand that no one knows who they are. Last picture of the row, he says to Lafayette, Well, there must be some mistake. I know we need you. And then he walks determinedly into Independence Hall, where the Continental Congress is in war session. First picture, second row, he tells one of the orderlies about his friends. The orderly replies, General Washington needs men, plain soldiers, not titled officers. Dick exclaims, but sir, it's Lafayette, Baron de Cobb, plain fighters, jeepers. Lafayette's going to be one of the greatest soldiers in our country's history. And Baron de Cobb is going to die like a hero fighting for us. Oh, I got to get to General Washington. <laughs> Unfortunately, Dick can't get to General Washington right away. So after explaining to the puzzled and disappointed officers why they are not immediately sent into the fighting, Dick bids them have patience. And last picture of the row, installs them in lodgings. He finds Lafayette and DeKalb a place to live in Philadelphia in a nice home fit for men of their good taste and breeding. First picture, bottom row, as they're unpacking their bags in their new lodgings, Lafayette, who has been disappointed up to now suddenly smiles and says, Oh, naturally your countrymen are acting with reason, Dick. Who am I? A stranger. But perhaps they will permit me two humble favors. Dick looks up with a hopeful expression. Lafayette goes on. One is to serve at my own expense, and the other is to commence serving, not as an officer, but as a volunteer, as an ordinary soldier in the ranks. Dick is to go back to Washington's headquarters with these offers. So he leaves the house immediately. As he comes out of the house to go to Independence Hall, a breathless soldier from Washington's militia comes galloping up. His face shows the importance of the news he carries. Do you mean that Lafayette is going to give money to the American soldiers? And that he's going to start at the bottom and just be another soldier? That's exactly what he's going to do. Oh, isn't that wonderful? He must be awfully anxious to help. He was, because he believed in the cause of liberty. And he was willing to do anything to help men gain freedom and justice and fair play. It's too bad everybody can't be like him. Yes, I should say so. It is too bad. But I wonder what news that man has that's on the horse. Well, that's something we'll have to find out next week. But I can tell you something about Rusty Riley right now. Oh, and I want to read that, too, because last week Mr. Kilgore had come in just in the nick of time to take Squire Bugs and Captain, Captain Kloon away when Rusty had captured them. That's right. And then the Coast Guard men caught the other smugglers out on a boat at sea, so the whole ring has been caught. And all because Rusty Riley was so smart and brave. Mm hmm And now they want to talk to Tony, Squire Bugs' nephew. So let's read and find out what they learned from him now with Rusty Riley. Gallop and run till the road is dusty. Give us music for his horse and Rusty. <laughs> Mr.
Mr. Miles has brought Tony to Mr. Kilgore for questioning. The detective says, Your uncle, Squire Boggs, and Captain Clune are under arrest for smuggling. You are apparently involved. What have you to say? Tony replies, He's smuggling? Well, good night. I, I, I don't know anything about any smuggling. He told me they were just pirating some lobsters. You'll make things a lot easier for yourself by coming clean. Now, what was your part in this? Oh, sure, sure, I'll tell you all I know. Uh, well, they got me this job as teacher for the kids so I could tip them off when the coast was clear. Well, how about that black light gadget? You had something to do with that, didn't you? Oh, sure, I did. I, I studied electronics in college. You see, it was my idea to use it on their lobster pot markers so they could take them in at night. Tony goes on, last picture, top row. You see, the way it works is like this. You mix a fluorescent chemical with the paint, and then, and then when you shine ultraviolet light, which is practically invisible on it, the paint becomes luminous. Mr. Kilgore nods his head, first picture, bottom row. All right, Tony, if you're telling the truth, it'll go fairly easy with you. I want you as a witness, so don't try to skip. Now you may go back to bed. Tony replies, Yes, sir. Thank you. I, uh, good night, sir. <laughs> Next morning, Patty and Rusty are having breakfast together. Patty is unhappy she missed all the fun by going to bed early. She asked Rusty if it's really true that Captain Clune and Squire Boggs are smugglers. And Rusty replies, Sure they are. They put out certain lobster pot markers with that special paint on them, and then the watertight cylinders with the smuggled goods were attached to them. And, and, and then they would go out with their black light gadget, and the markers with the cylinders would shine so they could pick them out. Patty tells Rusty that Tex had said there were thousands of dollars worth of silks in the old hulks. Well, at this moment, Tex comes into the room and says, Good morning, Rusty. Patty, want to take a little ride? I heard about a junk dealer on the post road who has some pretty fair saddles for sale cheap. You want to go? Last picture, bottom row, Rusty replies with enthusiasm. Oh, yes, indeed, Tex, we sure do. <laughs> Just think, thousands of dollars worth of silk, and Rusty was the one who found it all, and, and he was the one who figured out about that black light all by himself. Yes, it just goes to show, if young people would use their heads and think when they see things, they'd get much more out of life. Yes, and from now on, I'm going to think harder. I'm sure you are, and next week we'll find out more about those saddles. Oh, I just love saddles, and horses. And I love to ride. Then I'm sure you'll be here next week. Oh, yes, I will. Good. That's all the time I have. But before I go, here's that nice man with some interesting information. Well, honey, and all you boys and girls, I've got to go now. All right, Mr. Connie Weekly Man, but I'll be waiting for you next week. Okay, that's a date, and a date with all you boys and girls. Be sure to meet me with our little friend, Miss Honey, next week when I read Puck the Comic Weekly. For I'm the Comic Weekly Man, the jolly Comic Weekly Man. I'll be back to read the funnies to you happy boys and honeys. Don't forget, boys and girls, see you all next week. Your friend, the Comic Weekly Man. The Jolly Comic Weekly Man.